chapter number one. James chapter number one. We're going to look at verse number two through four. I believe that this morning the Lord has some keys to give us to victorious Christian living. And uh, I want to give you access to the keys. They're not my keys, amen, but they're access that God gives us through His Word, and so I want to make them available to you. I want to say this as you're turning. Last week, we, uh, Sunday night, we had a visitor here uh, from a Mennonite background, and then uh, had a chance to sit and talk and uh, just uh, share the things of God. And uh, he shared with me, he said, I like the presence of God that I feel in your church. The presence of God. <coughs> and he said, I've been visiting some churches, and it's not like that in every church. Mm -hmm. Amen. I don't want you to go visit other churches. Well, I'm right here where God's planted you. But know what we sense and feel is the presence of God. And I think it's a testimony when other folks come and share the presence of God that's here in the midst. Amen. God's presence. Amen. There's nothing like it. And then James chapter number 1, verse number 2, through verse number 4, the Bible says, My brethren, count all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Let me read it again because this is good what James writes. Mm -hmm. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Amen. Others would say it this way. Consider it holy, joyful, uh, my brethren, when you are in, 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 enveloped and encounter trials. That word holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, amen. Uh, consider it holy, joyful, amen. Consider a sheer gift, one would say. A, a delight, brothers and sisters, when trials come your way, consider it a great opportunity of joy. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider it, amen, a great joy. Consider it pure joy. That's what others would say about this particular passage of Scripture. Sister Jan, how do we consider it joy when we fall into difficult situations? Well, I, I do believe that uh, 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 they, these are tests that shows who and what we are made of. There's a test called the jeweler's test. And the jeweler's test is, uh, you, you know, similar to what God puts us through. But the jeweler's test uh, would test that something really is a jewel. Uh, Job said this. He said, yet man is born unto trouble as sparks fly upward. Amen. Man is born unto trouble as sparks fly upward. Have you ever seen sparks fly upward before? Maybe something rubbing roughly across another surface, those sparks flying upward. How many of you would like to be that object that's sending sparks flying upward? I don't see any hands. No volunteers this morning. But Job put it in that vernacular. He said, yet man is born into trouble as sparks fly upward in Job 5, 7. And so the jeweler's test is, is the determination whether it is authentic or whether it is ersatz. Ersatz means this. It means a substitution, an imitation, uh, a synthetic, a phlox, a mock, a, simula a simulated. So are we this morning, are we a genuine jewel for God or are we ersatz? You know, each one of you out there had the privilege of being a jewel for the kingdom of God. And God is going to put you through the test to see if you are genuine or you are substitute, if you are mock, if you are counterfeit, if you are simulated. And so they say if you take a diamond and you put it in water, a real diamond, Sister Dietrich, will not lose its glitter, it will not lose its brilliance, Sister Tiffany, when it's dropped in water. However, anything that 
is manufactured that is not the authentic and that would be an ersatz, a, 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 a fake, not genuine. When it is dropped in water, Sister Susan, it will lose its brilliance, Sister Tina. So how is it when we are dropped in water? I believe this, what James says is, is that uh, we, uh, the trial of our faith, he says, count all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. When God wants to see if we are genuine, or if God wants to see if we're imitation, you can say, I'm a Christian all you want. Now, I can say I'm a duck all I want, but unless I quack and waddle and swim and let water roll off my back, I'm not a duck. Uh -huh. How about it? Amen. You can say you are whatever you want. Whatever you want. But God's looking to see if you say you're a Christian. Uh -huh. He puts you through the jeweler's test to see if it's still brilliant and still shines, even when you're dropped in the water. So there's five things I want to look at this morning that I believe are keys to consistent victory in our Christian walk when we're in the midst of a trial. Anybody in here never go through a trial before? You've never gone through a trial. Wow. It's unanimous. How many in here have gone through a trial before? I think every hand in this building raise, raise, is raised. I've gone through a trial before. And so there's some things that this morning I want to share with you that I think are important for us to be consistent in as Christians when we go through a trial. Whether you're going through a trial this morning, allow this to be ammunition for you to be the true blue believer Christ wants you to be. Or if it's just knowledge to put somewhere for the time and Sister Susan Moore will go for trial, put it in the right place. Foul away. Put it under the right alphabet that you'll be able to pull it out and use it. But the very first thing that I think that we need to look at this morning is, is this. James says, my brother, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. To say it in a more uh, uh, a way, not taking away from King James, but saying in a way that helps our mind wrap around it and understand it in our, uh, uh, our vernacular. Amen. Maybe we'll be saying, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse or different temptation. That word count means to consider. Uh, consider when you fall into temptation or difficulty to evaluate. Let me ask you this. Is joy the response that we get when we fall into temptation? Uh, when your car breaks down or when someone's sick or, or when you are struggling, temptation has overtaken you. You immediately think, man, this makes me happy. Oh, this brings joy to my soul. Uh, this is an opportunity to experience joy. Is that what you really say? Probably in the human way, we don't. But I believe that God wants us to be challenged that we can consciously say that this is an opportunity for the kingdom of God to be advanced in my life. So I'm going to embrace joy. I'm going to commit to this with joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. God wants us to rejoice. Mm -hmm. Think about this. How would it be this morning if you were placed into a prison? Think about that. Now, Paul was placed into a prison, but they were not treated as humanely as we would treat prisoners nowadays. Uh, it was an atmosphere that, that wasn't as comfortable as, uh, as home. It was damp and it was dirty. It was dark. It was filthy. Uh, you were not treated with dignity and respect. And so here it is, Paul. He fell into the place where he was in prison. Uh, but he said that we should, when we encounter moments like these, count it sheer joy. Wow. Wow. There's a lot of things that count as joy for Josh. But troubles and trials. Sister Dietrich, I'm sure you were very thankful for the Lord, but you know, probably not in your plans to be in the hospital after this past week. But Paul said, count it as sheer joy. 
He says in our text that we are to count it joy when we fall into diverse temptation. That when gives us the idea that it's unplanned, it's unexpected, it's unavoidable. And so when this occurrence happens, that it comes when the test and the challenges. James says to count it for joy. Count it for joy when it happens. When you fall into diverse temptation. There's another story the Bible Jesus used to talk about that fall. Do you remember that man who was traveling in between Jericho and he fell where there were thieves and where there was a band of robbers? He fell into their hands and they robbed everything from him and they beat him and threw him off to the side of the road, leaving him as dead. That poor man did not plan or expect to be beaten or robbed. It was unplanned. It was just a, 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 an event that was just he could not avoid. It happened to him. And so here it is when we fall. The same word fall was used in that, that, that same uh, parable that Jesus gave. Uh, uh, Paul was uh, that he fell into prison in Acts chapter number 27. Uh, there, there, are, there are some times that we fall into things. And so how should we respond to that when we fall into something? Our expectancy is to know that our life is lived in the shadow of the things of God. And when we fall into occurrences that are unplanned, we should count it sheer joy because the Lord is working something in our life. Amen. In Acts 27, Paul was on the ship and Sister Jan. The Bible says that he was on the ship and it was coming where two seas met. Can you imagine the current, Brother Dennis, that's happening there? Two different seas are coming together and the current is working against one another. And all of a sudden, the front of their boat, it lands upon a sand barge, but the back of their boat, Sister Jan, is being whipped and tossed, Brother David, in the middle of the storm. And so here it is, the, the boat is being beaten, it's falling apart, it's violently being beaten. They were in a lot of turbulence, and they were not planning this. The storm was unexpected. I want you to know that storms in our life come, and they cause turmoil, they cause chaos, they're unexpected, they beat on things that are our security, that we want to keep together, and it seems to be falling apart. Mm -hmm. And James, Sister Tina, tells us, that we should count it joy, Brother Eli? Storms have a way of altering our direction. They have a way of breaking our sense of security. They have a way of breaking our place of refuge. And they cause us to grab onto anything that floats. Imagine if you were on the Titanic and it was going down, you would be grabbing onto anything that was floating because you wanted to save your life. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the storms of life are. But that's really not how I want to plan and live my life. But sometimes God's plans are different. And for the child of God, we have to realize that our life is derived the kingdom of God. And even though it wasn't part of our plans, <coughs> James says part of the problem to be solved is our attitude of joy. We look at men and women who are heroes of the faith, but when they came into turbulence, when things were unplanned, <coughs> they grabbed hold of it with joy and expected God to bring a glorious outcome. God wants you to bring a glorious outcome in your life. Brother Justin was asking in Sunday school this morning, what does God think towards you? I believe God thinks that He wants to move by His Spirit in the New Testament church. I believe He wants to empower the church in the hour in which we live. But I believe God also wants to bring us an expected end. But it's us that get in the middle of it. And we can never experience victory because when we come into it, we don't grab onto the joy that God can work and move in this even when it's unplanned. You may say, Brother Seville, but what if someone else is 
cause, cause the pain or cause the dissension in my life. Do you not believe that God can't get in the middle of that? God is bigger than your neighbor, your friend. God is bigger than your family. God is bigger than a government. God is bigger than any other person. If we will allow God to get a hold of it and know that no matter what, the enemy may want to work in our lives or people may want to work against us. Amen. If we'll grab hold of it, God will bring us to a joyous outcome that will bring glory to His name because God is wanting to work and move in each of our lives. See, sometimes we perceive what we perceive to be a storm is God really just disciplining us. I love what Hebrews 12, verse number 11 says. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse number 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. And nevertheless, after it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are, ex uh, are exercised thereby. What is the writer of Hebrews saying? We love to go through life without ever, ever having problems. But, but, but God, because He loves us, there's times where He will chasten us. He will allow things to happen in our lives so that it brings a benefit and a profit to us uh, when it comes to spiritual things. How many of you like to get up every morning and exercise? Wow, look at all those hands. There's a few people. You know why you do that, John? Because you made it a habit in your life. I'm sure that you probably at first didn't do it, but you realized the benefit of it. Caleb, you're a young man. You're playing football now. Uh, he's going to be our sports star. We'll, 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 we'll see us take a picture all over the front of the Upper Dolphin Civil, right? Uh, but, but he's motivated because he knows at the end there is something good for him. Do you know what God is saying? And when He exercises a little chastening in our life, when, when storms come, when trials come, when things are difficult, uh, it doesn't prosper us to live life easy all the time. But Sister Alice, He allows it because He knows the benefit of it is far greater than any of the trial and the working that we're going through. And God wants to work and move in us. So grab on with joy. I believe part of the life of victory is the attitude of us grabbing on with joy. We've got to learn how to look beyond the trial Amen. and see the end of it. got to see the end of it. you got to see the end of it. And I said, Brother Seville, it's so understandable, un 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 uncomprehendable right now. Don't understand it. Brother Seville, how can I see the end when it's so cloudy right here in the middle? Brother Seville, you're crazy because we don't know what the outcome will be. I may not be able to tell you what the outcome of your situation is. I don't even know the outcome of my own situation. But I do know this, that I love God. And whatever God has brought into my life, the outcome of it is going to be for His glory because He's not going to abandon me. And there's something greater for me to gain and glean and understand and grow my faith in. It's an opportunity for me to go in prayer. It's an opportunity for me to go to the Word. It's an opportunity for me to trust God in the things that I don't understand and knowing that the outcome will be good. Do you think Paul Paul knew the outcome. He didn't know if he was going to be released from prison. Do you think he knew the outcome of if he was going to be uh, relieved from, uh, from what he wanted to be relieved from, from the burden, from the thorn of his flesh? No, but he knew that God would help him and the outcome would be good because God was working in his life. Amen. God wants to work in your life. And so I know it may seem cloudy, and I know it may seem difficult, and I know it may seem hard, but we sometimes just have to put our glasses on, amen, and bring clarity that God is working in this, and God is working in me. And so with joy, I'll grab hold of it. Listen, at midnight, Paul and Silas, the Word of God says they began to pray, and they sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. You see, it's the attitude for survival when we grab hold of joy. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to our brother, and then God's already been instructing in the service for us that we don't need to fear. God knows the outcome. And no matter what the outcome is, God wants to be glorified. 
We've got to know that the end will be okay. God's going to see us through. Everything's going to be okay. Put your trust in the Master and know that this too shall pass. I like what Paul wrote when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse number 7, verse number 9. He said, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord Christ, that it may depart from me. And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Listen, uh, the real need oftentimes is not elimination of the trial, amen, but it is grace to endure it. God, give me the grace to endure I'm not here to argue over what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. I don't even really care at this point. What I do know is Paul came to a place where he didn't say, uh, God, rest. Rescue me from it. Eliminate it. But he said, God, you're going to give me the grace to endure it. Amen. If we will grab hold of God's grace. Amen. And know that that attitude is the key for victory in our life. Amen. That God is working in us. And there's a glorious future that is promised to us. Because God's grace is sufficient. The second key, and I'm moving very, very quickly this morning. Amen. Is an understanding mind. Amen. So James says that the trying of our faith worketh patience. So it's an attitude of joy, but it's an understanding mind that God is working patience in us. Patience here is that endurance. Amen. As we wait upon God. Amen. When we allow God to work and move in our life. Amen. The more difficult the battle, the sweeter the victory. You hear me this morning? The more difficult the battle, the sweeter the victory. I want us to think about a few things this morning. David said this. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord and He climbed unto me and He heard my cry and He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and He set my feet upon the rock and He established my goings. He has put a new song in my mouth. Amen. Uh, he said, I even praise unto God that many may see it and fear and trust in God. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. David said this. He said, God, God has heard me. What made David a mighty man of God? Because he grabbed on joy and he trusted God to see him through. Amen. What about Paul? He said, those temptations have taken you such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. But with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Paul said, hey, wait a second. I know that you're trying you have troubles and you have trials, but God will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able. Yep. He will make a way of escape. Child of God, no matter what you're going through, God has an escape route. God has an escape route. So an attitude of joy, an understanding mind. But the third key is this, a submissive will. We spend so much of our life oftentimes fighting against God and the will of God. The model prayers was this, not my will but thine be done. The submission of God, whatever it is, if this is a trial, if this is a test, if this is the conflict that you have for me to go through in life, God, I'm going to grab hold with joy. And my mind will understand that you're working all things together for good to end up loving you. But I also will allow you to be that. Hey, listen to me for a minute. Have you ever got to an altar where you pray, not my will? Not my will. But thine. Yeah. An experience where we are exhausted of self and we empty out of all of our desires. 
and we allow the will of God to be perfected in us. If we'll grab hold of the will of God, we would find that joy will overtake our journey. Mm -hmm. And our expected end will be as promised in the things of God. The fourth thing is a believing heart. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. And lean not to thy understanding. It almost starts out of your life. Who cares what I think? Who cares what you think? But how about taking our heart and just allowing God to have it? Get your thoughts out of the way. Too many times your thoughts get in place of where your heart is. Lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge Him. Yeah. You gotta understand that going through the trial, you gotta put your faith in God, not in your wisdom and not in your own ability. You gotta understand that God is in control, and in the midst of the trial, Amen. He can and He will take care of everything. Amen. And Paul said, "This grace unto you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ." Amen. Would you just allow the peace of God to overtake you this morning? Amen. So you think about all that, an attitude of joy, an understanding mind, a submissive will, a believing heart. The fifth thing is a humble spirit. Listen, this life that you and I are living is not about us. At the end of the journey, it's not going to be about oh, what we have done or who we are, what we have accomplished. But the end of the journey is really all about what Christ has done in our life. And all of the things that done for eternity will last. So we've got to keep a humble spirit. James says, let the brother of a low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. God, you be exalted in me. But the man that everyone else sees may be Christ. Not me. May be Christ seen and not you. So try if you come at the end this morning. morning, the Word of God says in 1 Peter 5, verse number 6, that if we would humble ourselves under the, the mighty hand of God, that He would exalt us in the new time. God, humble me. God, right now, I've professed a relationship with You before many people. But God, right now, I'm being put to the test. Am I genuine? Or am I something to In the middle of the test, have I lost my shimmer and glisten? Or God, has it been seen? You through me. As I pray for this morning's message, I don't know everything everybody's going through. And I don't sit back and target one person out. That's not the way I work. I feel like God operates. But God dropped this message in my heart. Because He knew there was people here this morning that needed to know what the keys to victory are. Grab hold of joy. Let that be the attitude of your life. Let it be what motivates you because you know at the end of this your faith is going to be stronger and victory is going to be sweeter than any of the bitterness of the trial. Would you this morning stop thinking with your mind and let God have his way in your heart? Would you this morning not think about it being you but humble yourself under the hand of God, knowing that God wants to do a great work in you. Mm -hmm. And in due time, He'll exalt you. But this trial, it's about God. And what God wants to do in you. This morning, even when you're going through the battle, you can still have victory, knowing that God is greater than the battle. David said, the battle is not mine, but the battle is the Lord's. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by His Spirit. So this morning it's time to let go of fear and break way through faith. I wonder this morning if there's some soldiers out there 
that's in the middle of battle. This morning, the keys to victory are yours. Amen, would you grab in and grab hold of the keys and commit it to God. Everybody that will, gather in around these altars. Amen, I believe that our American Revival Church this morning, there will be men and women that will leave. Amen, not battle pressed and not battle worn, but there's going to be some men and women that's going out of here with joy in their heart, not thinking with their mind, but trusting in God with all their heart, knowing that He's working in the battle. Would you gather in this morning? Amen. Victory.